welcome, welcome back, bienvenue and all that jazz. It's time to talk about some books. Or in particular, today I'll be wrapping up the books that I read in April. So as always, we'll dive into just some brief stats to talk about how the month of reading kind of went overall. So I read nine books total, which seems to be kind of like my average for the month so far this year. I've been reading about like eight or nine books a month, so that's fine. And those nine books totaled up to 4,436 pages. And as always, a ton of it was immersion reading. So I listened to about 50 hours of audiobooks. And my average star rating continues to be quite solid. Like I'm at least mostly enjoying the things that I'm reading. So we love to see it. So my average was about 4.2 stars rounded. So that's not bad at all. Like, I'll take it. In April, I was kind of continuing along reading some fantasy romance in particular that I'd kind of been hearing about kind of on the periphery and just continuing with those series, whether or not they were originally pitched to me as like male male or whatever it was, or just like something different about them. Because I've been finding that especially the more like mainstream fantasy romances that I've been reading have a bit of, been a little bit... They feel a little cookie cutter to me. They feel like very similar characters, very similar tropes are used, very similar. And I understand that like to a certain degree those tropes, if you like that particular trope salad and it does it for you, then it's almost like a comforting factor to have those. So I understand, but they just don't work for me, especially not in the context of like a romance. Like I'm kind of like, where is the chemistry or the compatibility or the genuine like of somebody beyond just their physical. So I was continuing my journey trying to find some more of those things and then also just continuing finishing off either series or collections of stories and worlds that I've already read. And so that segue, actually quite conveniently, will jump into the first book that I want to talk about, which was my lowest rated read of the month. And that was Tales of the Celestial Kingdom by Su Lin Tan. And I gave this 3.5 stars. It was totally fine. So usually if I'm getting like a short story collection in a world that I've read, so this is in the world of the Daughter of the Moon Goddess and the Heart of the Sun Warrior, I like it to be fleshing out aspects of the world or the lore or something, giving me something. And this almost felt like a collection of deleted scenes from Daughter of the Moon Goddess and Heart of the Sun Warrior. It gave you a kind of tiny bit of like information about some of the in-between moments, but like it was kind of unnecessary for me, at least. I mean, the cover is beautiful, but she is kind of blessed by the cover gods, let's be honest, because Daughter of the Moon Goddess and Heart of the Sun Warrior also have stunning covers. So, like, it was... It was fine. Like, I don't know that I would ever reread it. I don't know that I ever need a copy. There was some nice artwork inside, which is kind of par for the course with this kind of, like, short story collection. I just... I wanted more. I wanted to learn more about the Celestial Kingdom. I wanted to learn more beyond just the characters that we already knew from the main story. And so it just was kind of a little bit of a letdown, but it was still fine for what it was. And then from there, I was continuing on with my Cosmere along. We are in our second year reading through Stormlight Archive. And so that way we should be all caught up by the time book five drops in November, I want to say. And so I have a whole playlist linked for all of the different spoiler discussions for the Cosmere. But this month I read Edge Dancer and Words of Radiance. Words of Radiance landed much higher, so don't fear, Cosmere fans. You don't need to come out and chase me with your torches and pitchforks yet. But Edge Dancer is fine. It's perfectly fine. There are some interesting lore bits that are kind of dribbled in there that I don't really want to mention because I don't want to spoil anything for the broader Cosmere. I'll save that stuff for the live show. But Edge Dancer follows a particular character, a particular precocious child character, who is supposed to be 12 or 13 and acts not like any 12 or 13 year old that I've ever met. And I mean, I used to teach children. So it's not like just because I'm gay, I never have seen a child in my life. Who do I? Like I've, I taught martial arts for 10 years. I worked with a lot of different kids. And while some of the like actions of this character kind of ish make sense. I also just don't like the character very much. And just like the journey to like eat a bunch of different pancakes is just like so kind of incongruous with what the tone of the rest of the Stormlight like Archive is. And so it just feels a little bit jarring going back to it. And then also like the first half of it is one of the interludes in Words of Radiance and I read them back to back. So I also was like, I don't need to read this again. So <laughs> it it's fine. I mean, I gave it four stars because there are some interesting like lore drops and some more information about one of the heralds and what they've been up to. And I like that information because that's one of the things I love most about the Cosmere, especially Stormlight, is this crazy rich lore and just learning how all the puzzle pieces put together. So I like it in those aspects, but the character and the actual plot of that novella, 
No. <laughs> So maybe I should bump it down. I don't know. Whatever. I rate things based on how I felt as I was reading them. So it's fine. The next thing I read was The Hemlock Queen by Hannah Witten. And I also gave this four stars. And this is the follow-up to The Foxglove King. And this is kind of a... I mean, it's printed by Orbit, which is technically an adult imprint. But it feels much more like new adulty Because there have been other series like The City of Dusk and The Midnight Kingdom. There's been some other series that they've published in the last several years that feel more new adulty, Where you have kind of younger characters that have some of the more like stereotypical traits that you would associate with like young adult characters, but then the plots and worlds are a little bit more complex, like an adult. So it's kind of like this in between. And it was fun enough. There is some cool world building. And the end of this one has me kind of excited for book three, which is like, they always do this to me, all these friggin' authors with their damn like cliffhanger endings where you're like, oh, wait, oh, damn. Okay, now I need to know what now. It's annoying, um, <laughs> but it also has me sucked in, so it's doing its job. So the Hemlock Queen and the Foxglove King, we're kind of following this kind of political situation. There's a lot of cool necromantic magic. So in this world, in this particular series, there's this dead body of the goddess of death underneath their city. And so her kind of death magic kind of leeches out of her. And so there's these people who are able to like channel that power like back into the earth to kill plants or whatever. Because if you walk through it, it'll like literally melt the flesh off your bones. And so the main character that we follow in both books is a person capable of channeling that mortem, that death magic. There's also like a god of light. There's some intrigue with like what happened to the gods and why she, her body is where it is and other gods in the world. And so there's also that kind of a looming meta plot. And then there's also a lot of like political stuff because she kind of gets herself embroiled in the politics of this kingdom. And so it's just fun. So if you're looking for something that's more like world building is the part where you're going to get the enjoyment from and the characters may be a little bit annoying and kind of rash at times, but they kind of have that kind of melodramatic like CW style flair. I think that you could have a fun time with this series. If you want like the most epic and dark and uh, like it's not going to give that to you, even though the magic system makes it maybe appear like it might it is not going to give that to you. It's going to be much more like melodramatic and kind of just fun times. And so if you're in the market for that, I think it's a great series to check out. The next books I'll kind of talk about as a duo. So I reread Dark Rise so that I could read Dark Air by C.S. Picot. And this is a very, and they're both like very equal in quality. I mean, I gave them both four stars and they are very much like Lo not Lord of the Rings. I was going to say Lord of the Rings. They are very much King Arthur inspired where there's like swords and stuff. <laughs> wow. So deep. But they're just the time period that they're set in feels very medieval-y. It's also kind of like historical portal fantasy-ish where there is this like sect. And this is all in book one. I'm not spoiling anything for book two. Don't worry. There's this sect that is here to kind of shepherd these artifacts from previous ages so that when this dark lord kind of resurfaces they are ready so they've been kind of training future generations on how to use these artifacts and how to protect themselves and that kind of stuff and so we start following some characters who are being chased for reasons that we don't know by agents of this dark lord because he seems to be on the rise once more and then we get taken and protected by the stewards and then kind of things unravel from there there's a lot of kind of reincarnation maybe and like who is who and what really happened with this Dark Lord? What was he like? What were his motivations? Is him rising bad? Like, there's a lot of questions that are kind of involved in there. And I think it's just a fun series. It is definitely, like, more young adult leaning. But it's just, if you like King Arthurian legends, but you want, like, a twist on them, there's also a lot of LGBT-ness kind of surrounding it. But that is kind of one of my gripes with the series, because there is a particular male-male, maybe romance, maybe. But, like, it's just... It's it's kind of tainted a little bit because there's all of these over overtures of like questionable consent where it's like, was the guy actually okay with things that were happening in the past? Is he okay with it now? He was almost kind of enslaved magically with this magic collar thing, but like I don't know. Like it's weird. It's 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 a little bit weird. So I'm kind of like holding final judgment on how I feel about that aspect of these books until I'm 
I don't know if it's going to be, I'm assuming there's only one more book because it doesn't seem like there's that much story, but maybe I'm putting my foot in the mouth and maybe it's going to be a friggin' 15 book series. But if there is only like one more book, I'm kind of withholding judgment until I see kind of how it plays out because it's very much like, ooh, that makes me a little bit uncomfy, but then it'll be explained a little bit. And I'm like, maybe it's okay. And then it'll, something else will happen. I'm like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so it's like, I feel very conflicted about that aspect, but the rest of it is a lot of fun. There are some good platonic relationships between a boy and a girl and just kind of the mess of it all. So this is another one that feels like very melodramatic, but kind of still very fun. So I would still recommend you check it out if any of that kind of appeals to you. The I have two more four star reads to talk about. The first one I'll talk about is A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows. And this is a male male fantasy romance. And I Again, I have kind of conflicted feelings. So this one starts with a pretty graphic on-page sexual assault of one of the characters. And we do a lot of processing that trauma and healing from that while also like starting a new relationship. And it's kind of a marriage of convenience style relationship. And we are also kind of having these themes of the character that we are following originally is from a kingdom which is kind of homophobic and just not accepting of who he is. And he gets married off to a different kingdom where being gay is okay. And so you kind of see that transition of almost what a lot of gay people experience of being closeted versus being out. And that, that kind of common phrase is as you grow up, it'll, it gets better, like right as you get out of high school and you get to have your found family. So you get to see a lot of that kind of theming in the book as you follow this main character from their kind of homophobic upbringing and seeing what it's like to have a relationship that doesn't need to be hidden, that they can be themselves. And just, it was very sweet. But also, I had a little bit of complaints because the the love interest was like almost overly perfect. Like in every single situation, when this character is dealing with some real trauma and having some kind of flashbacks or almost PTSD-like responses to some situations is always perfect always perfectly patient perfectly understanding says the right things at the right time and so it just was like I wish that there would be a little bit more like nuance to how this was playing out and I but I did appreciate seeing those struggles with the mental health and showing ways that you can have kind of communication but like obviously everybody deals with their mental health differently and so the communication that worked for this character might not work for everybody so I appreciated seeing those things but I wish that there would be like just at least a little bit later that the, there would be some flaws in that love interest because it was they were just perfect in every way in everything ever and while that's fun for a bit of after a while I was like okay can you have like something like <laughs> can you be more than just like the perfect incarnation of understanding and patience because I don't know it just like felt a little bit not realistic because while we were dealing with really realistic heavy trauma the way that we were healing from it was a little bit like not so it was just like a weird juxtaposition for me personally I still really enjoyed it and I thought the romance was very sweet and I did really overall like it but that kind of hindered it and then I'm also just I feel like so many of these fantasy romances kind of they have this kind of shallow murder mystery plot that we're kind of like we're brought together because we're solving this murder mystery. And like, I wish that there would be a little bit more attention paid to like the magic and the actual plot to have like really crazy reveals and like really cool things happening in the plot too. And this was closer to that, but still it felt very much similar to like A Taste of Golden Iron with how the plot progressed, how the relationship progressed and just all of those things. I will say I did really appreciate that we took our time getting to any kind of spice. We took the time to get to know each other, build a real relationship, especially given that this person was healing from trauma. Like it was very well done with how we took our time. We do get a little bit of spice, not a ton, but a little bit of spice. And so I, I did have a really good time with it. And I would really highly recommend it if you're looking for good fantasy romance where it feels like a real romance and not just lust. This is an excellent one to check out. And then the last fantasy romance that I'm talking about will be A Letter to the Luminous Deep by Sylvie... I don't know if it's Catral or Cathrol. This is her debut book. And it was all told in an epistolary format. And it was just very cozy and sweet. And so in this book, what's happening is we are following, there's kind of this family of this famous like scientific explorer who lives in this house on the bottom of the ocean. And one day it seems like one of the siblings has gone missing. And so the the siblings of the people who have gone missing start corresponding with each other through letters 
and their siblings were also pen pals and have this kind of budding romance in their correspondence with each other. So you're kind of seeing both of these things unfold. You're seeing their sweet kind of romance blossom while you're also trying to piece together what happened to them. There's also some really cool things about this world because there's a lot of kind of like lore about how these peoples used to live on like these kind of floating islands and something happened where they're now on the sea. And so they live in like these kind of floating research facilities as they're trying to understand more about their world and to survive. And so there's a lot of emphasis on scholarship and learning and like cataloging the different organisms that live in this ocean. And so it's just really interesting. I will say if you have any kind of like thalassophobia or like fear of open water or underwater or anything like that, this book will probably trigger you because there are sequences where we explore the deep ocean in these little like bubbles and just talk about seeing the empty abyss and like all of that kind of stuff. But it's really cute and really good. So if you like Epistolary Format, or even if you aren't used to it, I think it's quite well done in this. I have a feeling that the audiobook is probably phenomenal because you have the four different main like letter writers. You have the two siblings and then the actual lovebirds. And if they were actually narrated differently, I think it would bring like a whole extra layer of dimension we also get to see a blooming friendship as these two people are trying to find out what happened to their loved ones. And again, it's the start to a series. So there's definitely like stuff left on the table and we get some pretty crazy reveals because there's some really weird stuff going on in the world that we find out towards the end of that book. So I'm really intrigued to see where it goes next. But I haven't heard anybody else talk about it and I really need somebody else on this planet to please read it because it's very adorable. It also has really good representation of um, like obsessive compulsive disorder because the female love interest definitely struggles with her OCD and needing to do certain things to check certain things before she can sleep and like her difficulties with kind of like it seems like social anxiety and like there's a lot of good mental health representation on page as well and so I can't like I really would highly recommend it and then the last two books that I have to talk about are my two five star reads of the month so the first one was a reread. I read Words of Radiance, and I had actually forgotten a significant portion of what happened in this book. And just for the majority of the Sanderson books that I've read, I don't usually get that like emotionally invested, but there's something about the way that he does certain reveals and certain political backstabbing and things like that that happen in The Way of Kings and Words of Radiance that just get my like blood boiling and get me so invested. And so Words of Radiance really just continues the loveliness that has been this reread of the Cosmere universe and Stormlight in particular. Our live show should be in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned for details about where, when, what is happening with that, because I'm really looking forward to diving into some more spoilery details of Words of Radiance and Edge Dancer before I continue on with Oathbringer, Dawn Shard, and finally Rhythm of War, so we can get ready for, is it Wind and Truth? So I'm just, it was fantastic. Like, I still think maybe currently in this reread, Way of Kings is a little bit better, but I just, there's something so magical about the, the start, the seeing how the story starts. And then there's also something magical about how it ends. And so for a book that's in the middle, kind of further expanding on the lore and what's going to be happening to be this fantastic is also something to be lauded because it doesn't usually happen for me. I usually either love the beginning or the end and the middle is usually the middle, like it's doing the middling most. <laughs> so yeah, but Words of Radiance, fantastic. If you have not yet read Stormlight, you're doing yourself a disservice. I know the books are chunky, but they do read quite fast. There's also a lot of cool artwork in them that I would recommend. So you want to have a physical copy as well to check out some of the cool sketches from Shalon. And it's just so much fun. The last book that I'll talk about and my favorite read of the month was The Stone of Farewell by Tad Williams. This is book two in the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy. And it just continues to be awesome. Like there's elements that feel familiar from like almost like the Disney, the Sword in the Stone, like King Arthur retelling adjacent with how a lot of the magic in this world is kind of locked into these mystic swords. And so we're kind of on this quest to find these swords to kind of be able to fight the Dark Lord. But we're also spending so much time kind of developing these characters. We spend a lot of time developing our main character, Simon, seeing how he's grown from being this kind of like kitchen boy in the castle and how events were thrust upon him and just learning more about this world and the city and this like ancient, almost elven-like lore and going to this almost like Lothlorien style place. Like there's a lot of like things that feel kind of 
familiar, like Lord of the Rings-ish, but like so vastly different. And just the way that the lore is unfolding and the quest and journey that we're going on is excellent. So I am thoroughly enjoying my time in back in this world in Ostin Ard, and I can't wait to finish off the trilogy. If you at all like classic epic fantasy, because I think this started being written in like maybe the 80s or something, it's like it is an older work, but it is so good. And it inspired George R. R. Martin from Game of Thrones. So there's a lot of like political maneuvering, but also kind of Lord of the Rings feeling stuff to the world building. So it's like familiar, but new and just excellent. So if you have never checked out this trilogy, I can't really recommend it more highly. Like I think it's quickly rising to be one of my favorite series like it is so good and I can't wait to see how it all concludes in to Green Angel Tower and I'm just I love the characters I love the world I love the story it's a very quest fantasy so if you don't like traveling quest stories if you're not like if you have tried Lord of the Rings and you hated it it feels very similar to that. I will say the writing is quite different. It's not as descriptive in my mind. Like for Lord of the Rings, J.R. Tolkien spends a lot of time kind of describing the languages and doing all the poetry and the songs and spends a lot of time describing like landscapes and building atmosphere. So if those are the pieces of Lord of the Rings that didn't work for you, I feel like Memory Siren Thorn does that less. But it still is that kind of traveling quest classic fantasy story. So if like those stories don't work for you, maybe not. But like if you've been one of those people that's been itching for that classic fantasy story and you haven't checked out Memories Are and Thorn, now is your time. And with that, we will start bringing this video to a close. If you just want to leave an emoji, leave some kind of sword for Memories Are and Thorn. If you want to talk to me in the comments or talk to me about any of these books, I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. Please, as always, if you want to talk spoilers, just say spoilers and leave a bunch of spaces so that we don't accidentally spoil anybody else on any of these stories. But that will do it for today's video. So please do all the things. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to see more bookish content like this from me. Other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye!